So now I call our fourth um, deputation to the table, um, representing Empowered Christchurch Limited, Seamus O'Cromtha. So as with the other um, deputations, you have 10 minutes, and if you choose to allow time for questions, obviously that's some, something for you to choose to do. Thank you. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. Um, I'm representing Empowered Christchurch, just to make clear, uh, we're not restricted to the South Brighton, South Shore area. We have members from many different parts of Christchurch and beyond. Uh, but obviously the, the discussion today is on the problems relating to the Brighton area. Uh, so you've had deputations from medical practitioners, residents associations, so I won't waste time by going over things that have already been said, but I'll try to respond to some questions that have been uh, posed by councillors over the last week, just to clarify some things. Uh, firstly, uh, it's clear that we are at a crisis point here from what you've heard this morning. Uh, communities have been fighting for their survival for the last 10 years. Uh, we are now at the point where many people don't know what to do because they have been blocked, because no decisions have been made. And I think at the root of things is land damage. Uh, most of these problems relate to the fact that nothing was done by EQC and nothing was done by council after the earthquakes to raise land to protect it from erosion, flooding, high groundwater and all the other problems that we see today. Uh, discussions were held between EQC and council in 2014 proposing area-wide mitigation. Nothing was done on this matter and this is why we are in the position we are in today. Uh, one councillor asked uh, about the ISO 31000 risk standard. So just to explain that, if you take the example of the Port Hills, you decide what the risk to life is and according to the ISO standard, if you have a risk of one in 10,000 of a fatality over the course of the year, that is intolerable. And that is the reason why homes were red stickered in the Port Hills. So if you contrast that with the coastal areas in Christchurch and in Canterbury generally, uh, you have seismic risk, you have high groundwater, you have erosion, you have um, lateral spreading, you have liquefaction, uh, you have insurance problems on top of that, which is not a natural hazard, but all of these problems combined, there must be a risk which is higher than one in 10,000. Therefore, the risk must be seen as intolerable. Therefore, action must be taken to mitigate or eliminate that risk. This is what we have not seen from the council or any of the responsible authorities over the last nine years. Risk-based planning is another thing that we should clarify. So risk-based planning says that rather like a triage system in a medical emergency, you look at the most vulnerable people, the people who are at risk most, and deal with them. I did a Red Cross training course many years ago in Christchurch, and one of the interesting things that our trainer told us was in a, a multiple pile-up situation, you do not pay attention to the people who are screaming loudly. You go to the people who are quiet because they are, they are the ones who cannot express what they are feeling. So it's rather the same here. The real victims of this situation are not myself and other people who are shouting loudly. They are the vulnerable people who have been left and swept aside, uh, the people that um, Dr. Cook referred to earlier. So on the basis of risk-based planning, you should look after a fire that is beside an, an oil, de oil depot before you look at a fire which is in a, a quarry or a brickworks. So that, that makes complete sense. The other, the other matter I would like to point out is insurability. This is a huge financial problem for many people in the coastal areas, and there, it's the result of the whole recovery process where houses were not repaired, land was not repaired, 
and people do not have insurance. There is a, a growing, growing pool of houses which are both earthquake prone, which should attract a higher risk assessment under the ISO standard than for life uh, fatality risk, but this has not been done. More and more people have no, no insurance. More and more houses in the coastal areas are being sold and snapped up by speculators. And we're at the point where decisions have to be taken to spend a lot of money to, to safeguard people, to rescue the situation. This is a unique opportunity because you're in the middle of negotiating with the Crown. Uh, to go back in history, in 2014, Tonkin and Taylor estimated that land damage, the costs for EQC, would amount to $2.14 billion. <coughs> uh, they then revised this down by shaving a little off here, shaving a little off there. Then they introduced diminution of value. So this is particularly important for coastal properties. If you were at risk of flooding, EQC paid on average $25,000 per property and left people with the risk. The land was not remediated. The result of that is they have no insurance today. <coughs> They have no mortgages today. So it's only a question of time before banks pull out, insurance pulls out, people are flooding, and they don't have the money to pay for it. Everything that they have saved for during their lives is gone, and their children and their families have no future. So I would ask, in the negotiations with Crown, ask where the money went for land remediation, which was estimated at $2.14 billion. Uh, why was $525 million released to the Crown in the midst of the suffering in Christchurch? All of this money is really money that was stolen from what people should have received in the earthquake recovery and has disappeared. So in negotiations, ask the Crown, who's going to pay for this? Because otherwise, this will be a, an explosive disaster which will get worse and worse and worse. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Dion. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned the, um, the, the payments from EQC on the increased land and um, flooding vulnerabilities. Um, do you think that process was wrong or not right? And, and the reason I'm asking is that there's an EQC inquiry at the moment where these feedback need to be also fed back into so that we don't do this again. But do you think this has increased the problems that we're seeing now? Massively. Um, I attended the EQC land community information meetings, which they held, I think it was 2016, if I remember correctly. Uh, they produced an incredibly arcane, complicated, incomprehensible system to explain how they were going to pay for increased liquefaction vulnerability based on uh, a matrix, based on the value of properties before and after the earthquakes, based on technical reports from Tonkin and Taylor, which we now know left out key information and downplayed the actual damage. So yes, I think it's a, it's a huge influencing factor. Make sure you feed that into the EQC inquiry as well. well. We have made a detailed submission to the EQC inquiry and we'll be meeting with um, Dame Sylvia later this month. Thank you. Pauline. Yeah, excuse me if I'm being ignorant here, but can the land be remediated, and how would that happen? Um, if you ask a, a structural engineer or a, a geotechnical engineer, all land can be reme remediated, but it's a question of what that will cost. And I think in the coastal suburbs, when you look at the condition of the soil, sandy, silty, it would be extremely expensive to remediate it. So this is why EQC has run away from the problem. And this is why we're in the situation we're in today. I think it would be horrendously expensive to do area-wide remediation. But if you're asking, I think one councillor asked during the week what proposals uh, we could make to solve the problem. It seems to me that certain properties have to be retreated from. Uh, you cannot protect them. You have a temporary stop bank which has to be moved inland to provide more of a buffer zone. That is the least expensive solution to the problem. Uh, provide protection where possible, where it makes sense for the next 100 years. Relocate people where it's too expensive and doesn't make sense for economic and uh, social reasons. And have you got any idea how many 
houses we might be talking about if you're looking at um, you know, relocating? Well, a, a lot of the most immediate risk affects what is coincidentally or not coincidentally the residential unit overlay. So this was recently introduced by Council. This has allowed people to rebuild without resource consents, which would make them uh, build at higher levels and give them more protection. Mm -hmm. It also lets council off the hook because they would have a hazard notice if they built at lower level and they would not be liable in the case of flooding. So I think a lot of the residential unit overlay will be the area affected. On the estuary side to the centre roughly of the Brighton Peninsula. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks for detailed answers to questions as well and for joining us this morning. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed.